This is Research Like a Pro, Episode 11, Organization. Welcome to Research Like a Pro, a genealogy podcast about taking your research to the next level, hosted by Nicole Dyer and Diana Elder, accredited genealogy professional. Diana and Nicole are the mother-daughter team at FamilyLocket.com and the creators of the Amazon best-selling book, Research Like a Pro, A Genealogist's Guide. I'm Nicole, co-host of the podcast. Join Diana and me as we discuss how to stay organized, make progress in our research, and solve difficult cases. Let's go. Welcome to Research Like a Pro. We're excited you're here today for our episode about organization. Um, I'm Nicole. And I'm Diana. And we are going to start off today by reading a comment from one of our eCourse students about the podcast. Because we ran out of reviews, we need you to leave us some more reviews of the podcast on iTunes and Stitcher. So here is a comment about the podcast from one of our eCourse students. She says, I am a self-taught dabbler in genealogy going on two decades. I am thrilled to be taking the Research Like a Pro e-course and am grateful for the knowledge and mentoring that Diana and Nicole impart, especially as it pertains to organization and best practices. I own the Kindle edition of Research Like a Pro, have listened to each of their podcasts at least twice, and I'm a huge fan of their teachings. Thank you so much for sharing that comment with us and that makes me feel a little bit nervous that people are listening to the podcast more than once, but I'm really happy that it's helpful. And I hope that we can improve our podcasting skills over time because we still feel kind of like beginners at this. So thank you for that comment. I want to let you know how to leave a review because some people have mentioned that they're not sure how to do that. So if you would like to write us a review for the podcast, We'll read it on the podcast, so that can be fun. And the way to do it is if you use um, Apple Podcasts or iTunes to listen, you can go to your podcast, Apple Podcast app or iTunes to share a review on the podcast there. And then if you don't use iPhones or those apps, you can use Stitcher and you can just go to the Stitcher website and we'll put a link in the show notes and you just click the link to that and then it opens up a page for the Research Like a Pro podcast. And it lists all the episodes. And then if you scroll down to the very bottom of that web page on Stitcher, there's a link that says write a review. And if you click that, it opens up a pop-up box where you can just type in a comment about the podcast, what you think of it, and put in a star rating. And you don't even have to sign in or log in to do it. It's really easy. You can just do it from your phone or from your computer. And you just click that link on Stitcher and then leave a review there without even putting in a login or anything. You just put in a a nickname or something and it asks you for your email address, but it doesn't display the email address on the podcast review. It's just so that they can identify who it's from. So that's how you leave a review on Stitcher. And we hope that you will do that for us. And we had a fun idea. We thought if you leave a review We would love it if you could also ask us a question or give us a comment or an idea of something you'd like to hear us talk about on the podcast. And if you ask us a research question or another kind of genealogy related question, then we will go ahead and answer that at the beginning of the podcast each time. So we'd love to hear from you. And if you will just do it through the reviews, then that will help get the podcast out there and get more people listening. So it will benefit both of us. So we hope that you can leave us a review and ask us a question. All right, so today's topic is organization, and we're going to start today with a story from Diana about a suitcase. Want to pick up with that? (laughs) (laughs) My suitcase story. Well, I have my dad to thank for my suitcase story. So when we moved uh, from Seattle to Utah in 2002, I suddenly was left with time on my hands because I didn't know very many people, didn't have friends, didn't really have a social life, you know, when you move, everything changes. And I had this really cold winter outside. I was in Utah and I was stuck in the house all day. And I decided it was the perfect time to start doing some genealogy research. And so I think it was about January. And I called my dad and I said, Dad, do you want to give me all of your stuff? I really am interested in doing genealogy. He'd been working on it for, gosh, probably 30 years, but 
just really felt like he couldn't make the transition to the computer, just heard his eyes look at the computer and he was, he was getting older and just didn't feel like he could do it anymore. And he said, sure, your mother and I are going to Hawaii and meet us at the Salt Lake airport and I'll give you everything I've got. So, you know, I met him at the airport and it was really fun because he handed me this old suitcase and it was stuffed full of all of his papers, his folders, everything he could find from genealogy. And so I got all of my genealogy in a suitcase. And I was so excited to go home. And Nicole, you probably remember when I brought that home and I set up a big table up in my craft room, which became my genealogy room, and started going through those papers. And it seemed pretty overwhelming because, of course, there was no system of organization. The, the papers literally were just papers. There were a few file folders, and but those didn't seem to have much of an order either. And so I had to start from square one in figuring out how to organize genealogy. So what I learned to do, and my advice to all of you out there who have a similar situation, some of you may have boxes and boxes of papers, and you may have inherited so much stuff, and you just have no idea what to do with organizing it. But here's what I did. I divided the papers into piles according to families, and I just tried to sort them by surname. I took my dad's four grandparents and those four main surnames. I would just sort the papers. And if I had somebody that I really had no idea how they were related, you know, I just had kind of the anonymous pile that papers I didn't know about went in until I could figure them out. And it was just it's a beginning point to put some kind of order into the mess. And you obviously can't start with everything at once. So, you know, after you're sorted, then you can just start with one family, one surname and start, start going from there. So if you already have your papers filed and you're just trying to go electronic, then we have some ideas for that also. And I think Nicole's going to talk to us about electronic databases. Yes. I'm all about the electronic da electronic databases. I do most everything online or on my computer because I don't have a lot of space to store a lot of papers. I think a lot of people feel that way that you know, we don't have huge filing cabinets and huge desks to put papers. And yes, of course there's some papers that you ought, you you absolutely have to keep because of their um, value and their originals and that kind of thing. But beyond that, I try to keep most of the rest on my computer and online and uploaded to the cloud and backed up in a few different places. But, but right, so let's talk about electronic databases. So to organize your family tree, it helps to have like a software program that you can put all of your information into. And I know a lot of people use the ancestry trees and family search family trees, but let's talk for a minute about your own software program that only you can edit and that isn't relying on an internet connection and some of the advantages of that. So roots magic, or, you know, we used to use personal ancestral file and now we use ancestral quest, which is similar. And some of the other ones, legacy family tree and roots magic. So these kinds of software programs for creating a family tree, these electronic databases, why would you want to use one? Well, they have a lot of really powerful features and they can build great reports and they have research tools like to-do lists and research logs, and they can help you create citations. Another great thing that it that a database can do for you is store information about living relatives. So this applies to people who are using the family search family tree. If you're using only that, then you can't really store information about your living cousins there because it's really only for deceased people since it's a public tree that other people can access. So storing private information for living relatives really is best done on your personal software program. And then another thing I mentioned is that your database is available to you even without internet access. So if you have it on your laptop and you go to an archive and you don't have the internet there, you can still see your family tree. And other fun things that your program can do for you is to publish your tree to a website or share your tree. A lot of the software programs that I mentioned earlier sync with family search and with ancestry or with my heritage. And so you can share your tree on those websites by syncing your personal program with it. And 
the greatest thing is that you have full control over your data. You're not relying on ancestry, which could go bankrupt and close down and lose your tree. I'm not saying that that will happen, but you know, if you have anxiety about that happening, then this could help with your anxiety. And um, you do have full control over that because it's on your computer and you own it and no one can change it like they can in the collaborative family trees like WikiTree or Family Search Family Tree. So those are kind of the reasons that we say to others when we're teaching about why you need to get your own family tree software program. And I want to just add one more thing to that with that whole ability to store information for your living relatives. That's really important when it comes to our DNA, because who are our DNA connections on ancestry or family tree DNA? Well, they're all living people. And just a little example of that is, I think it was last summer, I had a really close match, a second cousin, I believe. And I emailed and said, how are you related? And we found out that we shared great grandparents Dora Royston and William Schultz. And as soon as this cousin told me who her grandmother was, I went right to my database. And luckily from that suitcase of papers that my dad gave me, he I had put in a ton of living people. And I was actually able to find the cousin right in my database, which was great because I could see immediately our connection and I could see how we were related. So that right there just gave me a whole new sense of why it's important to have a place to store our living family because DNA results are all about our living connections. So anyway, if you've never thought of that, then that maybe gives you a a reason to do your own personal database. So now what if you don't have anything? What should you start with or what can you do? Well, several of these, in fact, I think all of them except for Family Tree Maker have a free download. And so Nicole mentioned several, Roots Magic, Legacy, and Ancestral Quest all have free downloads. And if you want to purchase the premium, it's only, I think, $30 to $50. I'm not sure what, what they all are at the moment. But they are not super expensive. That gets you lots of upgrades. And then sometimes you have to pay a little bit more if you want the, the next build. But it's really a pretty minimal cost. And if you don't do anything else, then, and you have an Ancestry account, you could start by just creating your own personal tree on Ancestry. And it can be private or public, but it is a tree that only you can change. So that's that's an option for you to start. And I think most people have started doing trees on Ancestry, but if you haven't, then have a tree somewhere. You need to have a tree where you can put your information that you're going to discover in your papers. So one of the things that I like to talk about when I'm, people will always ask after I teach a class such as this, they'll say, well, which program should I buy? And I will say, well, when you go car shopping, what do you do? You go try out different cars, you do your research, you see what features you want, and you make your decision that way. Well, I'm going to say the same thing about these computer programs. Do a little shopping online. They all They'll tell you right up front what kind of features they have. Look for reviews, see what other people like, and then decide what your needs are. And you can even try them out for a test run. So, you know, they they will all get you to the same place, just like a car will get you to the same place. They're all going to give you a place to store your family tree. It just depends on what you need from a program. Like we said, we use Ancestral Quest because it has a collaboration feature. And so we can both use the same file and then we can upload it. Actually, it's called checking in and checking out. So when we're done with the file, we check, check it back in and then the changes are made in the cloud. And then when Diana checks it out, it has the changes that I made to it. So that's one of the things we like about Ancestral Quest. But I know people who just love Family Tree Maker and that one's a bit pricier. It syncs with, ancest- with Ancestry and it's really intuitive and pretty looking. So if that's the kind of thing that you're looking for, maybe look into Family Tree Maker. All right, let's talk now about creating an electronic filing system for all of your papers and documents that you're scanning in. So we talked first about sorting your papers into piles, and then we talked about getting a a database ready so that you can start putting information into it when you go through your documents. 
Now we're going to talk about setting up your electronic filing system so that when you scan these documents, you'll have a place to put them on your computer. So there's multiple ways to do it, and you have to figure out what works for you. But one essential rule is that you need to store your files in multiple places. So you can't just put them all on your one computer at home because then if the hard drive goes out, you'll lose everything. So you need to think about three different places. Maybe you can put them on your hard drive and then you can also upload them to a cloud storage option like Google Drive or Forever or some other way to back up your hard drive to the cloud. And maybe you also put them on to a flash drive or a DVD or CD like the millennial CDs that last for a thousand years. <laughs> Have you heard of those? <laughs> I haven't, but it sounds great. And I really question whether that will work or not in a thousand years. So. Well, Tom, what's his name? Tom, ask Tom on the Extreme Genes podcast he always talks about those DVDs that are going to last a long time. So I know there's a lot of physical um, options for keeping your data on off, off the cloud and off of a hard drive. If you want to do that on a, a CD or a DVD or a flash drive, flash drives don't last quite as long. So they're a good short-term solution. Another thing you could do is back up all of your information to um, your friend's computer or your a family member who lives in a different state so that if there's a hurricane or a flood, then your information is safe. But it's also safe on the cloud too, I think. So there's just choose several places to store it so that when something goes wrong, you'll have a backup. And you can even just use an external hard drive and back it up to that. There's a lot of choices. So I mentioned Google Drive, and I want to talk a little bit more about that because it's a, a great tool that we both use. Google Backup and Sync is what it's now called. It's a way to back up all of your folders that live on your hard drive of your computer to the cloud on Google Drive. And you can access your files online as well. So it's a really great way to access your information from all of your devices. If you have a laptop and a desktop computer in your office, and then you have your tablet that you use when you're on the couch and your phone, you can sync Google Drive documents to all of those devices. So you can see your precious family photos from each one of your different devices. And you can put your genealogy research files on those devices too. So the way to do that is to download Google Backup and Sync program to your computer that you're originating your files from and all of your devices, and then you just sync to the same Google Drive. And there's a free option if you only use 15 gigabytes, and then if you do 100 gigabytes, it's $1.99 per month. And this isn't like a sponsor or an ad. We just really like this system, so it's what we use, and we wanted to tell you about it. And I actually store all of my photos on Google Drive. So I pay for a terabyte a month, which is $10 per month. And then I know that all of my stuff is backed up and that if I lose it or my hard drive is corrupted, then I know that everything's safe on Google Drive on the cloud. So it gives me a lot of peace of mind. So um, Diana, why don't you tell us about how you organize your computer files? When I first started scanning things and putting things into my computer electronically, I didn't have a very good naming protocol and I would just kind of make up different things, you know, like this is Grandma Schultz, 1944 in, um, you know, California or whatever. And, or, you know, I'd put death certificate for Alabama and my file names all didn't sort very well and they weren't very they weren't very clear specific. And so I decided that I needed to have a protocol. And so I set up a protocol for how I name my files and then actually how everything is stored on my computer. So I set up a folder and I use Google Drive as well. So in Google Drive, I have a folder that's called genealogy research. And I know that that is where all of the documents for my people are in genealogy research. So when I click on that, then I have surname folders and I do my surname folders in all caps. So it's really easy for me to see that that is the surname. So I have, for instance, a Royston surname folder. That's one of my main lines going back. When I click on that, then I have all the various Roystons that I have collected records for. So those folders are named Royston, again in caps, 
comma, and then the surname and middle name. So I would, or the middle name and the first name. So I would have Royston, comma, Robert Sisney. And then I put the birth year. So I have born 1848 in Alabama. And the reason I do that is because my ancestors weren't very creative with names. And sometimes I'll have three generations all with the same name. And so I realized that I needed to have born, you know, a date and a place so that I can figure out which one of these men is who. And then once I click on the individual, then that is where I have all of their documents. And so in Robert Sisney Royston's folder, I will have, um, you know, all the censuses that he was in. I'll have newspaper records that he's mentioned in. I'll have his pension record. You know, anything that I have used for evidence or that I have scanned in or that I found online is in his folder. And my naming protocol for those documents, I have decided that I am going to use the date first. So I will put 1850 and then I put the type of record census and then the name Thomas B. Royston and then the place Chambers County, Alabama. So for a while I had to put my put a little note in front of my computer with my naming protocol. So I'd remember date, record, name, and place because I would keep kind of getting that confused. But now I have it down. So it's really easy for me to quickly name my files. And I love starting with the date because then they are arranged chronologically within my person's folder. So it's really great because it, it creates this little mini timeline of documents right within the document folder. And I can really quickly find exactly the document I need, or I can look at it and think, oh, I don't have the 1870 census in this individual's folder. I should go get that and put it in here. So that is, that's the system I have created. And I know other people do something similar or have maybe a little tweak to something like that. So I always just give the advice to, to do what makes sense to you. You know, however your brain works for organizing, that's the important thing. But set up some kind of a protocol for naming your documents and a protocol for naming your folders. And then it'll just make things go so much more smoothly. You won't have to think about how to do things. You just know how to do it. And it will keep you more organized as you go. That's good advice. I really like the idea of writing down your protocol and putting it in front of your computer because then you can always remember how you're supposed to do it. I always forget that kind of thing. So it's a good tip. Let's talk now about a paper filing system. So for those papers that you do want to keep, those archival documents such as photographs and letters and those birth certificates and any scenario where you want to keep the original after scanning, let's talk about that. So first, you've got to choose where you're going to store the documents. Maybe you have a filing cabinet or maybe you don't. So then you need to get some kind of filing box, which you can get at Walmart or Target. They have a lot of those filing boxes. That's what I use right now. I have a couple filing boxes to store original certificates that I've ordered and photos and that kind of thing because mom has most of the good stuff at her house. So I don't really have that many, but I do have some. And so I put them in my filing box and I use file folders and a good practice is to put um, archival plastic sleeves in your on with your documents that are important or old. So you can find archival level um, plastic sleeves that won't deteriorate over time and, and melt all over your document or whatever. So, um, but don't ever laminate a document. I, I've seen some documents that have been ruined from that, but you can find a lot more information about how to take care of your archival documents online. And so we won't go into that much, but you can, Choose your own system for your filing system, your for organizing your files, and we use one that is um, location based. So we put down the name, the surname of the family, and then the location that the record is from. So I have a lot of folders that will say Milam County, Texas, and then they'll say Schultz. So I know it's the Schultz family and all the records for them that are in that county. So the location-based filing system worked really well for us when we got started. So that's what we chose. But there's also a lot of different kinds like a surname-based or a family line color coded system. And then a numbering system where you just simply have a number for each document. And then 
you put them in file folders with documents one through 20 and so forth. So it just depends on how you like to do it and how your brain works and what works for you. So once you figure out where to put your documents, whether it's in a file folder or a box, then you can figure out your own system and go from there. Right. And it, I'm glad you mentioned the locality um, system that we did. That one just works so well for us. And it was really, uh, it was just so providential because right after I got the suitcase from my dad at the Salt Lake airport, our local um, LDS church was having a family history fair. And I went to this fair and there was a great class on organizing your research. In fact, there were about three classes and I went to every single one of them because I wanted to know how to do what to do with these papers. You know, I had this whole table full of papers and they were sorted by surnames, but then I didn't know what to do with them next. And one of the teachers was doing the color coded family line system. And I listened to that and it just didn't really click with me. And then I went to this one that was taught by Jill Crandall, who was a professor at Brigham Young University in family history. And it was locality based. And I just thought, Oh, that makes so much sense. And it was just like my brain caught fire. I was so excited to go home and start organizing all my stuff because I finally had a system that I thought would work really well for me. And so I still have the three big file boxes by locality of all the things, you know, for my years of research. And I'm trying to figure out time in my busy schedule to go through those and, and kind of get, make sure everything is digitized and in my electronic system now. So that is my next challenge. But here's what I did when I, once I figured out my system, I would, I kind of set a goal to just do a few papers a day. So I'd pick up a paper you know, out of my dad's suitcase. And I really had to look at it and try to figure out who it was about and understand what it meant, what it was. And like Nicole mentioned, we were using personal ancestral file. So I, we had started our database just from us, you know, we, I just started it brand new and I would, I had my dad he had given me some family group sheets. So I was, I was able to get the backbone of the family tree in there, but I would get these papers. And so for instance, I would pick up a marriage document and then I would go find the people in my database and I would enter in the exact marriage date and I'd make a note in my database. I didn't know about source citations back then. So I would kind of do my best to say, you know, this is a original document and gives this date. You know, I did my best with explaining the source for my information because I did understand the importance of that. But I would enter in all that information into my database and then I would um, file away that paper. So sometimes I would come across papers that were just garbage and I, you know, maybe it would be some notes my dad had, had made, maybe some microfilm numbers, but there was no way for me to figure out what they corresponded with. There was no, there were no results. And so, you know, you have my permission to throw something away if it is not of any genealogical use. And sometimes I would find duplicates. I don't know why, but I, I feel like my parents sometimes copied things over and over. And so I would find like three copies of the same family group sheet. So, you know, just make a pile for recycling or throwing away. Don't keep duplicates. Um, the other thing that we can do now that I couldn't do then is to locate the document online. So if you're going through your papers now and you come across a census, and we know that censuses are readily available online. They're on multiple websites, Family Shirts, Ancestry, Find My Past, My Heritage. They all have census records. So now what I do is I locate that census and I make sure it's downloaded to my computer and put into my, my person's personal document folder. And then I can throw away that census, that copy of a census record. Often the copies, you know, don't come out very very easy to read on a census on paper. They're, the writing's really small. And so I prefer having that just electronic because I feel like if I need to go find it again, there will always be a resource online for me to find it. But if it is something that maybe it's from a website that I'm not sure that website will stick around, then often I will print that and file that away 
because I have seen in the past websites come and go and documents that were once available now are not there anymore. So that has to be your judgment call about, you know, if you're going to save a paper or if you're going to just go electronic with it. So as you're going through your papers, you might come across things that you need to scan, like photos or original copies of perhaps a land deed or a will that's been handed down. So you'll need to scan those and make an electronic copy to keep in your folders, and then that you can upload it. So I think, Nicole, you're going to tell us more about what we can do with those papers using them as evidence. Right. So when you find a paper that has um, information about genealogy, facts, or evidence such as birth, death, marriage, land ownership, military service, then it is a source document and you'll want to do a bunch of steps. So you'll want to scan it first and file it in your electronic filing system so that you can find it. And then add the information to your personal family tree database, database, whichever one you're using, and attach it to the appropriate events. Create a source citation explaining what the source is and where it's located, who created the source, and so forth. And add that citation to your person that it's about and all the other people it's about and the events that it's talking about. And then add some notes to your database. Just kind of summarize the record details. That can be really helpful when you want to remember what's on the record and you don't want to pull it out. Um, You can then go ahead and create a source for that document on your online trees as well, Family Search or Ancestry, and even upload the scanned image of the document. And this is really helpful for other researchers who may be collaborating with you. And it helps you too, because you don't have to go pull the document out of your filing folder. You can just easily see it attached in all your different databases online and in your personal database. Make sure you add the source citation when you upload a document to FamilySearch or Ancestry or another online tree and add some notes to summarize the record details, just like you would in your personal database. So you can just copy and paste that. So that's what you need to do with your document when it create, when it contains evidence And it's really important, I think, to share that online on your online trees so that other researchers can see how you came to your conclusions, especially if that document is something that isn't digitized, like we talked about earlier. You know, if it's not a census and it's not a probate record that's available online or something else, but if it's one of those private letters or a document that only you would have, please upload that if you can so that other researchers can see where you got your information. Right. It's so important to make sure that we're collaborating. I don't know how many things I have found from other people that have been so great about sharing information with me. And so I always want to make sure I'm giving back to the community by uploading my information and getting it out there because it really is all of us working together that that's going to help us build our accurate family tree. Now, what if you come across in your papers, like I did, some information that doesn't really pertain to your family tree? Perhaps you've got some maps or you have notes from a conference and, you know, you've got some really great information here about how to search when the courthouse burned and you don't know what to do with that. And so what I like to do is use a special note-taking program like OneNote or Evernote, and it's basically helped me set up my own little genealogical library. I have both OneNote and Evernote, and they are... They do have different uses. I can see uses for both, but I've settled on Evernote to be the one that I use the most. And so what I do is I have, think of Evernote as like a collection of notebooks. So I always like to tell people, think of, you know, just a stack of spiral bound notebooks and inside each notebook are all the different notes on a subject. So for instance, I am accredited in the Gulf South United States region. So I have a notebook for Gulf South Helps. And inside that notebook, I have all the information whenever I come across an article, for instance, on Alabama land records or Georgia land lottery, you know, something that goes with those states, I will copy that to my Gulf South States notebook on Evernote. And then I can go there and it's electronic, so it's searchable. I can type in Alabama land records and it'll bring up all the 
articles or things I've saved about how to use those. And so it gives me a way to make all of that information accessible. I used to think that I could put all those in paper file folders or I had, I had this binder system and I found that I just never used it because I didn't want to take the time away from my computer to go dig out a map or to go, you know, dig out some notes. But if it's on my computer on Evernote and I can search really quickly, I'm much more likely to use all of my data. So I really, really have enjoyed using Evernote for that. And Evernote has a free version. The only difference between free and premium, I believe, is how many devices you can have Evernote on. I have premium because I use it quite a bit and I have it on all my devices. But I know, Nicole, that you have just the free version and that works just fine for you, right? Yeah, I started with the free version. I tried the premium for a year, but then I decided to do most of my notes and organization of stuff in Google Drive. So I just save everything there. But I do love Evernote too, because sometimes you just want to use the web clipper for Evernote and then you can take a screenshot and make notes on that. And there's some features for Evernote that I really like. So maybe it works for you to use Evernote, maybe not, maybe use something else, but we just wanted to share that because it's a great tool. Yeah. I found that a lot of people that I talk to, they, they go to a lot of genealogy conferences and every conference you get a syllabus that is usually several hundred pages long. And out of that syllabus, there's probably, I would say maybe 10 to 15 things that you really would use for your research. At least that's been my experience. So what I like to do is take those specific things that are really going to be things that I use and I add those to my Evernote. And, you know, Nicole, you could probably add yours to Google Drive. So, you know, it's good to have a way to keep track of those things because we do need to refer to helps. We just can't keep everything in our brain about how to research in different localities or different methodologies, different time frames. And so it's really helpful to have a place to keep all of our research helps. Great idea. I have a lot of papers like that floating around and sometimes I just take a picture of it with my phone really quick and then it automatically uploads to Google Photos because I'm too lazy to scan it or whatever. So it's nice when you can get those syllabi that are already digital instead of having to scan them or whatever. And I'll take my laptop with me to conferences and workshops and that kind of thing and just take notes directly into my Google Documents. And that's my favorite method for keeping stuff because if I write it down, then I know it's useful to me because it's something that, you know, I needed to hear. So everybody works differently with their notes and their learning, but yeah, definitely check out Evernote. So it's time to wrap up this episode. Did you have any more thoughts you wanted to share? I was just going to kind of close with a closing thought that we've mentioned several times in here to make sure that what you're doing works for you because our brains are all hardwired a little differently. And, you know, something that we said today might really spark your interest or it may just spark your interest to go find an alternate method because you want to do something differently. And that's all good. The important thing is just to do something to kind of start organizing and figuring out what to do with your papers so you don't feel like you're drowning in paper. Right. And I like the idea of just doing a little bit every day and just taking one paper and figuring out what to do with that one. And then once you've got it done, you can move on to the next one. And there's no sense in trying to do it all at once because that will just overwhelm us and then we'll never try it again. (laughs) Right. All right. Great. Well, thanks for listening today. And remember to go write us a review on Stitcher or in iTunes. And next time we'll be talking about productivity and genealogy research and how to make the best use of your research time. So we'll talk to you guys again next week. All right. Bye-bye. Good luck on your organizing, everyone. Thank you for listening to Research Like a Pro with Diana Elder, accredited genealogy professional, and Nicole Dyer. We hope that something you heard today will help you make progress in your own genealogy research. If you like what you heard, please leave us a review on iTunes or Stitcher, or visit our website, familylocket.com, to contact us. You can find our book, Research Like a Pro, A Genealogist Guide, on Amazon.com and other booksellers. We hope you'll start now to research like a pro.